I really wasn't expecting this today, but I think Charles just told us what fourth gen cryptos are going to be. Ready? Let's go. Man, Charles' video was so nonchalant. The title was Resources and One to End for Consensus. While Bitcoin and Ethereum maximalists are spending all their time, not all their time, a lot of their time explaining why Cardano doesn't matter, Charles is talking about what the generation of cryptos beyond Cardano are going to look like. And it's tantamount to a true ecosystem where actors might occupy a wide spectrum of different roles and actually get rewarded for those roles, just like delegators and staking pools do now. Kind of like an actual society. The real reason we all got involved with Cardano was the thinking. It was the thinking that was going on within the project. If the idea is to bet on the jockeys and not the horses, I think we did a really good job. So Charles starts out here by telling us about his sort of framework for approaching blockchain technologies just in general. And that's that they're, they basically have three tasks to decide who's in charge of making the block. Then you've got to make the block and then the network has to accept the block. That's re those are really the only three things that are going on in a blockchain, right? You have to figure out who's going to make the block. Then you got to make the block. Then the network accepts the block. That's it. So all the action is pretty much in number one. When we're talking about different protocols. So proof of stake, proof of work, whatever. They all kind of make, and we're talking about blockchains here. We won't get into the difference between DAGs and blockchains and other types of consensus protocols uh, that go beyond blockchains. We've discussed those in other videos on this channel. But between proof of stake and proof of work, Number two, making the block and the network accepting the block are really the same. There's not a lot of you know big differences there. Number one is very different, right? And the difference is in what resource you use to decide who's in charge of the block. In proof of work, it's sort of the computation resource, right? It's this hashing power that basically amounts to who has the most and most powerful computers, right? Who has the biggest where, warehouse of the, the, you know, most powerful ASICs using the cheapest energy with proof of stake. This is determined by ownership, right? Who has ownership in the system. And what Charles talks about in this video is the fact that you can have other resources besides those two that decide who makes the block. And for a lot of people who bought into the Gen 3 crypto thing, right, that we're going to move to proof of stake and we're going to do it in a way that makes sense in a really efficient bleeding edge technology kind of way, that's going to be a little bit, um, a little bit jarring, right? Because a lot of people who invested in the sort of Gen 3 idea we're really buying into proof of stake. So to talk about the fact that Gen 4 won't be proof of stake, you know, might seem a little bit, uh, might put you on alert a little bit. So the next thing Charles does is talk about why we want more resources. So he points out that there are reasons why pure proof of work and pure or, or pure proof of stake might have detriments. In pure proof of work, one example is that as soon as ASICs started working on multiple protocols, you had this perverse incentive, right? When when ASICs only worked on Bitcoin, there were and there was no other blockchain for miners to point their ASICs at, there was no reason for them to maliciously mine to destroy the network and then just point their ASICs at another blockchain because there was no other blockchain. So if they destroyed the network with malicious mining or destroyed the value of the network or the legitimacy of the network, then their the uh, money they had invested in their ASICs would go to waste, right? But as soon as you have other blockchains that you could point those ASICs towards, then they can engage in things like the Goldfinger attack, right? They could maliciously mine to destroy the you know legitimacy of the network 
you know, after having shorted the coin of that network and gone long on the nearest, nearest uh, competitor coin. We've talked about the nearest neighbor perverse incentive uh, with uh, proof of work chains in the past. In proof of stake, you know, you've got uh, this idea that uh, game theory dictates that if you own enough coin, you won't do any malicious block validation because it makes your stake in that coin worth less. But the second you have highly leveraged shorts that you can, uh, you can undertake in that coin, then maybe it could be worth it. Even if you've got a large enough stake to be the one to validate the next block, maybe it's worth it to maliciously validate the next block if you've got a highly leveraged short in the coin of that blockchain. While none of us who invested in the notion of Gen 3 proof of stake cryptocurrencies want to hear any of that noise, Charles is basically making the case that it in Gen 4 blockchains, it might be good if we don't put all of our eggs in one basket and you have uh, a diversity of different resources you're using to decide who gets to validate the next block. And he says there are additional ones. It won't just be a one to two. We won't just go in Gen 4, we won't just go from proof of stake to proof of work and proof of stake or proof of work to proof of work and proof of stake. It's going to be a one to end thing. The really hard part is going to be going from one to two different resources which are used to decide who validates the next block. But there will be additional things. And he talks about this notion of proof of merit, rewarding people for doing things that are good for the network. And this could take a lot of different forms, right? He mentions that when blockchains get super heavy, right? When blockchains get gigantic, Anybody who has used Daedalus recently and had to sync the entire blockchain knows that there's already a bit of data in there, right? It is not a tiny, tiny bit of data. And, you know, Cardano has only been around so many years. What about when it's been around 10 years? Then the blockchain starts getting pretty heavy. And maybe we want to reward people for providing storage for the blockchain but it's actually a longer list of potential resources. With proof of stake, the resource is ownership. With proof of work, the resource is computation. And then you've got storage that we just talked about, but you've also got things like social resources. Charles mentions, what about all the evangelists who are going out there in social media and telling everybody about how wonderful you know, a particular crypto project is? What about all the nodes on the network that just relay information back and forth? Currently, blockchains don't generally reward people for running those nodes. When you run a full node on either blockchain, it's kind of this thing you do to answer the call, you know, answer the call of the community, right? It's like, make sure you use the full node wallet, right? It's important we have nodes, you know, all over the earth, but none of them actually, you know, most of them, they generally don't pay you for that. And what Charles is envisioning is that in Gen 4 cryptos, all of these types of resources could be used to determine who validates the next block. All of them could be delegable. And we'd have a separate protocol for each of these things. We'll have a bunch of different proofs of X. You know, we've already got proof of stake, proof of work. Maybe we might have proof of, you know, social advancement, proof of storage, proof of relay. There's a whole bunch of different protocols that could be running how we look, how we, how we approach each of these resources. And Charles wants to kind of balance these. And he's, he's kind of envisioning that the hard part will be figuring out how to get these different protocols to work together, to compose together. Um, they're going and you know like like i mentioned he's saying that figuring out how to get two of them to compose together is going to be the hardest part and then going from two to n n just being uh, a variable representing any number sort of any here any number of you know different resources past past two um 
getting those going from two to n won't be the hard part going from one to two will be the hard part they're actually going to publish a paper later this year on a hybrid proof of stake proof of work protocol and we may we may have heard charles like very ambiguously vaguely mention this before but he's never outright said hey this year we're gonna have a paper on a hybrid proof of work proof of stake protocol uh, that's the one to two piece that's going from one to two and then the two to n the much smaller jump will come later but if you follow the cardano ecosystem the first thing man the first thing you're probably thinking of at least the first thing i think of is ergo charles is speaking in generalities here right he's doing what he always does he says blockchain technology is going to go in this direction cryptocurrency projects are going to go in this direction he's speaking generally about what he thinks the whole space should do but I understand that to mean, here's what we're going to do. He's basically telling us there's going to be a Gen 4 Cardano, a Cardano 2.0, if you will. I hope they don't adopt that moniker for that particular you know, iteration of Cardano. But there's going to be a Cardano 2.0, a fourth gen cryptocurrency that Cardano will morph into. Uh, he even mentions the date 2025. He's talking about 2025 Cardano. And given everything that Charles has said about Ergo, and if you, if you read some of the information on Ergo, it's hard to, I haven't yet been able to see, I haven't yet seen any articulations of a good argument that Ergo isn't like a, a you know, maybe the most advanced version of proof of work. Like it seems, Ergo seems to be as far as you can stretch proof of work right now. And a lot of the stuff, a lot of the arguments I see about Ergo are sort of like, this is how this is how we'll make you know uh this is how we'll make light wallets work you know uh weird weird sort of micro applications you know just sort of justify why we would need proof of work uh when we've got a big third gen proof of stake coin but i think the reason why charles seems to value ergo so much is this I think ergo is how they go from proof from uh, just proof of stake to a proof of stake and proof of work protocol. And in fact, when he's when he's describing the history of hybrid proof of stake and proof of work protocols in this video, he's actually citing projects that Alex Chirpanoy, uh, the uh, founder of ergo, worked on in the past. And of course, we all know he said over and over again how he thinks Alex Chirpanoy is one of the one of the uh, like greatest geniuses in the crypto space right now. So one of the reasons we shouldn't fear all this though, this sounds kind of scary. This sounds kind of scary. I'm not going to lie. But one of the reasons why we shouldn't be scared by all this is that we'll get to vote on this. This doesn't preclude in any way, any of the Voltaire stuff that's always been planned. The plan all along was the community would control this, this project. Cardano is something that, belongs to the community and the community will control it. So Charles says straight up, look, the community will get to decide how we do this and how to weight it, how to weigh, weight each of these resources in this mix where we determine like which of these, which of these resources will we actually use to determine who gets to validate the blocks and what weight will they have in the mix? You know, will it be like, you know, 50% of the blocks will be determined by proof of stake, you know, 30% by proof of work. And I'm just making up percentages here. These aren't percentages cited by Charles, you know, and then an additional 20% that goes to, you know, proof of storage, proof of, you know, social media evangelizing, you know, proof of relay, all these kinds of things. Uh, but it'll be the community that decides. And he even mentions the possible scenario that maybe the community decides, no, this is going to be proof of stake forever, right? And you could tell that Charles, he kind of very subtly implies that he doesn't think that would be the wisest thing because he labels it as a uh, Plutarchy, right? Uh, rule of the rich, basically, which, you know, in um, sort of philosophical and political science terms, is uh, something that is most often vilified and seen as not good. So I think Charles is sort of, it sounds like he's soundly in the camp that we need to go to a diversity of resources that determine who gets to validate each block. And he kind of, you know, 
we know at this point that Charles is from a family of doctors. So he often analogizes things going on in the crypto space to human biology. And in this case, he compares what he's talking about to a homeostasis of decentralized specialized components. And he talks about, you know, a human body having, you know, heart tissue and, you know, different, different types of systems and different types of cells within the body, but they all kind of work in homeostasis. And there's this really delicate, uh, but efficient balance achieved and maintained. And you don't want to take too much of any one type of cell out of the body or it's a problem, but you can change the mix a little bit. For me personally, I think he's right at this point to favor the diversity of resources being used to determine who validates the blocks. Right now, we can kind of get away with these pure proof of stake systems, these pure proof of work systems. But it is kind of like an early adopter take takes all kind of scenario, right? It's like everybody who mined Bitcoin with their laptops, you know, back in the day, they, their holdings went to the moon, right? Everybody who bought Cardano, you know, at three cents is pretty happy right now. But going forward, you know, some of those opportunities may never, may never appear again, you know, in any given blockchain, like there's no sign that you're going to be able to, to uh, mine Bitcoin with your home computer. People are going to want to jump on new blockchains. If it's always the early adopters who sort of get the vast majority of the benefit, they're going to want to jump on new blockchains. But if you create different roles for people, if people run full node wallets that are doing all the relaying of the information, if they get rewarded for that, people are going to want to do it. If uh, you get rewarded for creating storage, people are going to want to do that. If we create multiple roles for people to join the ecosystem, they're going to want to join the ecosystem. It's kind of like if you have a society where, you know, 10 generations ago, everything was already locked up. All the land in the valley was already, you know, staked out for, you know, for 10 different families. They own all the land. Everybody else is a serf. Everybody who comes to the valley has a choice of, you know, traveling to that valley and, you know, making their home somewhere else or being a surf in that valley, people are probably going to try to travel to a different valley. But if there's some chance for them to also have some benefit, you know, from, from being a part of that society, then people want to join that society. And I think, I think, uh, on this kind of timeline, he's talking about like five years from now, we may be in a position where crypto communities are starting to look you know, sort of like politically and sociologically, a lot more like little, little miniature societies. So I'm super glad that we're in a crypto project that's already thinking about this. But I think this kind of thinking is why we all got involved in Cardano in the first place. Talk to you tomorrow.